I'm Otto Scott, uh, speaking for Uncommon Talk, and I'm having a conversation with Justin, a gentleman from South Africa who has been here about a year and a half, and who comes from Durban, which is located just about where the Indian and Atlantic Oceans combine. It's on the Indian Ocean. All right. Very exotic, wonderful place. Favorite holiday city for most of the people of South Africa for a long time. With splendid beaches, magnificent hotels, expensive shops, very high level standard of living when I was there in 1981 <coughs> and 82. What's it like today, Justin? Well, Otto, um, the buildings are still there. Um, there are a lot more people there than before, but um, it's not the city that you saw in 82. Things have changed dramatically. Um, I think when, when you were there in 82, I would have said that the beachfront was probably relatively safe to walk around at night, and certainly very safe during the day. I'd say in 82 you would have had the luxury of um, being able to go for a morning swim um, and coming back from the swim to find your towel still on the beach with any valuables still underneath it. Um, in those days you would not have had to have um, seen adults showering nude in the showers on the beach. You wouldn't have had people living on the beach. You wouldn't have had people defecating on the beach. Um, you would have had the luxury of being able to go to the toilet and you would have found um, clean, attractive toilets in a usable state. Um, you would have been able to um, walk down West Street and gone to some very lovely shops there without having, um, without having people's personal matter lying in the gutters or smelling the smell of animal waste cooking on makeshift tables. Um, it would have been safe for you to have been there, except for the occasional pickpocket. Um, you certainly would have been able to drive your car through town and um, park it somewhere, and you wouldn't have had um, been in fear of having your car hijacked. Um, if you left it in the parking space, you would have had a, a very good chance of coming back and finding your car still there and not stolen. Um, by and large, most of my friends and relatives in South Africa no longer go to the center of town. It's no longer safe, it's smelly, it's dirty, it's ugly, it's horrible. The beachfront um, it has had an enormous amount of money poured into it in some kind of attempt to preserve what little is left of the tourist trade. And so nowadays there's probably as many security people and policemen patrolling the beachfront as there are tourists or holiday makers. Um, it's just not safe anymore. Um, a, a girl can no longer go into a toilet alone. Um, girl, people can no longer go to the beach alone. If you're going to go to the beach, you need to go in a large group of probably at least six people, preferably 12, so that half of you can watch your things while, you're, while the other half are swimming. Because if you do not do that, you will have your towel stolen off the beach. You certainly would have any valuables stolen off you, let alone off the beach, stolen off your person in broad daylight. And um, while I was there in the presence of policemen who would just do nothing about it, simply because the crowds are too large and too hostile for them to raise a finger. When did all that begin? Um, well, unfortunately, um, there's a there's a clear starting date, and that was about the time that, let me see, about February 1990. 1990. Mm, it, the, the country took a clear, well, the country's gone down in stages, aren't it? Yeah. Um, you know, I've searched my mind many, many times on this, and I, I feel that the country was actually at its peak as a country in about the mid-70s. Hmm. Um, then the 1976 the Wheat Riots took place, 
And in fact, I was doing business on that day, and I was flying over the other suite on an airplane, flying from Durban, Johannesburg, back to Durban. And the pilot remarked that there was a that something was taking place in Suita, and so he actually circled the the Boeing jetliner around Suita once, and then headed down for Durban. And we actually saw Suita in flames on that day. And that caused, I would say, the first um, cream of the managerial and entrepreneurial infrastructure of South Africa to the side that the country had no future and to leave. Um, the economy took a down turn in 76. Um, then it seemed to recover its breath again, and um, I, tr I just recall that by the time he came out in 81, 82, the country was starting to really um, come back again. And then it took another serious downturn in 1986. Um, in 86, the country went through severe the problems. I recall that it was because of a um, of the banks, the American banks, withdrawing their loans overnight. Um, should, I, should I go into detail about about that? Um, at that point in time, I recall in 1986, um, the Prime Minister P. W. Bosa was widely rumoured to be about to make a speech which they said would cross the Rubicon and, and in fact would abolish uh, apartheid. And in fact um, the foreign minister had apparently circulated rumours and reports to most of the foreign embassies and to the foreign financial community that this was about to take place. And um, PW apparently um, <coughs> tore up the speech, wrote his own speech, which was a totally contradictory to the one that, that Pickwater had written for him. And he gave a speech which actually reinforced the his principles and tenets that he intended to have, um, instead of abandoning it. And almost overnight the um made the American banks, I seem to remember Chase Manhattan City Bank, um, virtually all the American made the American banks. Um withdrew their loans from South Africa. The loans were always drawn on a rollover basis and when they would and they gave notice that when they were due to be rolled over, they would not be rolled over, they were due to be paid in full. Yes. I remember reading about that. Mm -hmm. The relevant minister in South Africa received a call mm -hmm. and I think it was from Citibank or Chase, I forget which, mm -hmm. saying that the loan was <coughs> the loan was being called. Mm. And he said, for what reason? And uh, no reason was given. It was simply called. Mm. That was a terrible financial shock for the government of South Africa. Mm -hmm. It was. Look, um, it was incredible. The value of the rand had almost overnight. Um, in fact, the country was hit by a drought at about the same time as that. And I was early in business in those days, and I personally suffered crippling losses. Because um, I had equipment which was in the process of being shipped, which suddenly, and um, the funny thing is, is that the banks that should have known better had advised people against covering forward on the foreign exchange. You know, covering forward means that you're able yeah. to buy forward and guarantee a rate. Right. They had told us that the RAND was strengthening and that we would be losing money if we covered forward. And um, this sudden shock of RAND having in, in its value almost overnight called, meant that almost everything that was due to come into the country, Cost double in price, which meant that there was a tremendous jolt to inflation, um, there was a tremendous jolt to small businesses, they had to carry tremendous financial losses, and um, that was probably one of, the, one of the blows from which the country would never recover. Well, <coughs> it's a very interesting theory behind this. Apparently, the United States at that time, our leaders, let us say, had decided that the best way to improve South Africa was to hurt it, to push South Africa into a one-man, one-vote frame of mind, and the best way to do that was to force it by economic privation. Now, it's a very strange theory. I think Paul Johnson, the English writer, 
about that time assessed this attitude. He said, if we were really wanted to improve conditions for the people inside any other country, we really should put more investments into that country, mm. improve its general economy so that it could afford to pick up and elevate its standard of living for all its citizens. Instead, he said, we've taken the opposite position. Mm. Well, unfortunately, um, it depends on one's viewpoint. If one's viewpoint is that communism is what is best for society, then um, certainly they did a lot to advance the causes of, of communistic socialism. Um, the effect of this was more widely felt on the blacks than on the whites, because it was the blacks who lost their jobs. Most of, I think you, you know that um, the business community by and large is English speaking, and by and large most businessmen in an entrepreneurial role or managerial role had or have a second passport. Yeah. And so when things really got too bad for them, they would just leave the country and go to Australia or New Zealand or England or, or get into America somehow. And so um, the white didn't really suffer nearly as much as the black man. The black man is, has taken the brunt of every economic sanction that has been leveled against this country. And that's an unequivocal statement. I've seen it with my own eyes around me on an ongoing basis. Well, over here, it was presented as a punishment of what the newspapers and the radio and the TV began to refer to consistently as the white minority government. Mm -hmm. And inherent in that statement was a, a sort of an argument which arose somewhere in the course of World War II. I remember that the war, which from our side, from the American side, <coughs> began as an effort to reduce Japan and Germany, somehow switched in full course mm -hmm. into an argument for a better world. And in this argument for a better world, somehow or another out of the edges came the idea that white minorities should not rule other races which you call anti-colonialism. And then the whole, the whole anti-colonial thing became intertwined with the racial argument. And the theory over here seemed to be that the black people of South Africa were somehow homogeneously black, like the American black people. Which is an insult to them. Did you say that's an insult? Yes, it is. Um, the characteristic of the black people of South Africa, first of all, is that they've never been enslaved. Secondly, they are extremely proud of their own culture. Um, no one would dare to, to, to tell a Kosa that he was no different from a Zulu or a Tswana, and vice versa. But South Africa always did have approximately 13 individual black nations who were as different from each other as the Portuguese are from the French. And it's no different to telling people that Europe should be one man, one vote, because all white people are the same. It's just, um, I think it's a ridiculous fallacy, and um, it's, it's an insult to the black man to compare all South African blacks with the American blacks. The American blacks is a unique, different person. He has been um, socialized into the white culture, his culture is, is that of the European in this country, from what I've seen. He speaks the same language, and he has very similar customs. Um, the black people, where I, I used to speak Zulu, and we always had very, very good relations with those blacks among whom we lived. And um, my black employees used to laugh at the way that we planted grass and then cut it. So they felt this was a really, um, just as an example, a silly thing. They said, well, if you're going to cut something, why plant it in the first place? And if you want to really cut it efficiently, well then why don't you get some cows on your lawn and make, make your lawn work for you? <laughs> and it's just a thing of culture. And you know, I must say one thing, that um, I would never be so silly as to say that there, weren't, that there was not racism in the country or that there was not um, bigotry or that um, land was not taken from blacks that should never have been taken from blacks. 
But by and large, um, the Afrikaans people that I had the pleasure of, of dealing with and doing business with, by and large, had no intention of ruling anybody. Their, their intention, they had a fierce desire not to be ruled by anybody, and they felt that every nation in the world probably felt that desire, and so um, this creation of these banter stands, these independent homelands, was a it uh, was rooted in, number one, their desire never to be ruled by any outside people. What, and that, there's nothing racial about that. They hated the Englishmen as much as they can, they hate being ruled by the AMP. Um, they fought for, for generations to get their independence from England. And um, they were quite prepared to give independence to every recognizable black nation in South Africa. They would have set up 13 homelands, do you think? Yes. <coughs> they would? Yes, they were prepared to set up, well they already did, if you think of it, there was Bender, there was before Botswana, there was Transkai, there was KwaZulu, there was the North Suti and the South Suti, that's already six. Mm -hmm. There was this guy that makes it seven. Right. Um, they were quite ready and willing, and, and you know, they went further than that. Um, they, they realized, they looked at the development of black cities in Africa, and they saw that there was always this huge urban sprawl. And they felt that it was wrong to have an urban sprawl because they felt that it was undignified for a person to live in those conditions. They felt that it bred socialistic communism and being a Christian government, they, they really, a Calvinistic government, um, they would want to do everything possible to oppose that. And they just felt that people converging on the cities was just not generally good. And I know that this um, control, I forget, impact control that they instituted was... Um, you know, really seen as a dreadful thing, but the way they viewed it was really no different to um, people in Portugal until recently you know, not being able to go, or well, people in Turkey having to have permits to work in Germany. And um, they went so far as to encourage industry to build factories next to or inside these so-called homelands, and they would then give them um, tax breaks and they would give them matching finance for wages, and they would give them um, subsidized transport of goods from there, so that so that they could keep the the tribal black man on the land, produce at home, keep the family unit intact. They also promoted the traditional structure of government of the black man. They recognized among the Zulus, I lived there, and so I saw this happen. They recognized the authority of the chief over his people, and so they worked through the chief among their people. And then um, each, um, each sub-clan or sub-tribe of the Zulus, for instance, had areas of allocated, allocated to that tribe. And so if there was any crime in the area, everybody then knew each other, they would know really who did it. <coughs> and, um, when there was, and that particular tribe, really that was a, almost an employment and territory that belonged to them. Mm -hmm. And no one else was allowed to come to that tribe area. And this was enforced by law among what they call impact control, people having to get permits, because um, a person who came from an outside clan or tribe would not get employment in that particular area of so-called white area. Now, I'm not trying to defend discrimination on the basis of, of, of race, but what I am trying to defend is that, you know, the, the Afrikaner did try, in all sincerity, to give people freedom. And I'll say this, too, that the black man of South Africa was far more free in those days than he will ever be after this election on April the 27th. Well, I was going to bring that up. <clears throat> I recall reading fairly recently, say within the last year or so, that the ANC decided to invade one of the homelands. Yes. And the homeland uh, soldiers yes. and leaders fired and killed a number of them. Yes. Now, what do you suppose will happen to the homelands when the ANC takes control of the central government? Well, funny enough, you talk about that incident, I don't know how many people know that that incident was a deliberate provocation on the part of, I think it was Joe Slover, the European Communist, yes, that's right. who was both the head of the ANC and one of the heads of the Southern Communist Party. Now, yes. I don't know if he's died yet, I know he didn't have cancer. I think he's still on the scene. Okay. Well, anyway, um, they had permission to proceed to a certain stadium and a band of people 
and they had set this thing up deliberately and they had given word that they were going to invade this car. Now they had official permission to go into the stadium, but they made it quite clear that they intended to invade the Swiss sky, which was an anti-communist government. And of course any government that becomes anti-communist immediately is fascist and this and that and every bad name you can think of. And they broke down a hole in the fence, and they rushed through the fence, out of the, out of the stadium, straight at the soldiers with the rifles. And I don't know what you expect a jittery soldier with a gun in his hand to do when he sees a mass of people rushing at him people who have made it abundantly clear that they intend to take those soldiers and place burning cars around their necks. Um, that's that situation. What's going to happen to the homeland? Well, the homeland has been made quite clear. And this is why I think there's every chance of a, of, at worst, a full-blown civil war and at best extended strikes and civil disobedience in South Africa. Because, in fact, the ANC has made it abundantly clear that the homeland will cease to exist when they take control. Well then, <coughs> now each of these homelands has a governmental structure of its own. Yes. Voted into place by blacks. Voted into place by blacks. So much for their vote. And each of the homelands uh, consists of a homogenous group. Yes. Those have their own culture, their own yes. their own language. Yes. They're all kin, so, so to speak. Yes. So it's not going to be too easy to dismantle them. Well, you know, Otto, you can do a lot of things with brutal oppression. Yes. And I think if people want to see brutal oppression, um, look at an organization that thought nothing of blowing up innocent black people in shopping centers. Yes. Look at an organization that thought nothing of taking people into innocent black villages and butchering innocent people in front of the rest of the village in order to make them do what they tell them to do. Um, an organization that can do that on its way to power um, is quite careful of keeping people in, in place, particularly if they have a press which is totally controlled by them, or one which at, at least is sympathetic to what they do. Well, I recall being told some years ago that on one of these necklace things, events was filmed. Mm. My first reaction on the film, which I saw, mm. was to wonder at the caliber of the photographers. Mm who could <clears throat> remain professionally removed while photographing this terrible murder of people being mm -hmm. burned alive. <clears throat> and I thought at the time that uh, they deserve severe punishment. And then later I was told that the same film was shown to Maggie Thatcher mm -hmm. when she was Prime Minister. Now up until then, Thatcher had gone along with a trend of events in South Africa mm -hmm. and in Rhodesia before that, mm -hmm. into Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. But after she saw the film, she said, I am not going to support the people who committed that atrocity. Mm -hmm. And she changed her attitude toward mm -hmm. the Commonwealth mm -hmm. and some of the arguments that the Commonwealth was putting up. Unfortunately, that same reaction didn't seem to apply in the United States. Uh, first of all, I don't think very many people saw the film. <clears throat> and our press coverage glided over these atrocities very quickly. I've never saw, I never saw any of them shown on our television, for instance. Well, I've seen them, you know, right around me. In fact, my housekeeper's son, um, finally became insane because of the trustees he was subjected to having to see. His his best friend was necklaced in front of him as an example of what happens if you become a government informant. These are just cool kids. Um, you know, the, the, the ANC, um, you know, there's, there's, and it's so tragic that here you see the Zulus being portrayed as the warlike, vicious people, whereas everyone else is portrayed as the poor, peace-loving innocents, and it's not the case. You know that, um, for instance, one of the successes of entrepreneurship in South Africa is the booming black taxi industry. Now, a black taxi is traditionally a minivan which officially holds 16 people in, into which they can put 32 people. Um, Toyota happens to be, Toyota South Africa as a side, happens to be one of the few companies I think in the world that's had to um, strengthen the gussets on the side frame for these taxis because they were coming up far this time. But anyway, um, 
when the ANC was um, allowed to break loose with the release of of Mandela, um, they started taking over these taxi routes. And um, if a taxi driver did not pay a um, a fee to the ANC and support the ANC and their stay away and everything they, that they did, because the stay away is something else I'll go into in a minute, um, that taxi driver would find himself butchered sometime, somewhere. And the ANC's method of murder is one at a time, here and there. Always strategic people. Um, people don't realize that Zululand has, KwaZulu, as they call it, has an, a freely elected parliament. It had town councils. Every town in Zululand had people elected by the blacks. To say that this is the first time that blacks are going to vote is nonsense. This will be the first time that a vote will be taken where the, the white people voting will no longer have a say over their own destiny and over the taxes w of which they pay approximately 75%. Um, uh, sorry, my mind just goes blank sometimes to get such a racial thought. But um, the bottom line about the intimidation is that the ANC has really moved in, and I can give dozens of examples of this, where they have moved in, taken over the taxi route, taken over essential services, taken over the unions, where um, union leaders have been um, removed and murdered and then replaced with ANC people. The thing about this method of murder that I, I wanted to bring up right now is that the ANC operatives will quietly take out one person at a time, and it's deliberate, carefully chosen targets of pro-Zulu, pro and Carter chiefs, pro and Carter councillors, pro and Carter mayors, Anyone who is of any significance, Fran Carter, can be sure that his name is on a death list. Now, the Zulu people are a warlike people. They're used to not being pushed around. And every now and then, a community of people who have seen atrocities happen around them finally became so angry, and I'm not justifying this, but they'll become so incensed at these murders that they will then get up to the Zulu war dance, and they'll dance all night and get to dance themselves into a frenzy, go after their sticks and spears, which is the weapons that they have available, and they will butcher people of the opposing tribe, because that's the way that, that they traditionally, <laughs> in a tribal manner, would settle differences. <laughs> you know, I, I recall the um, Zulu side of the story coming out of one of these um, atrocities that a hospital committed. And what had happened is that the single Zulu men who were away from their families would live together in a hospital. They very frequently work for six months, and then spend six months at home with their family, and come back and work for another six, six months. Now, these people obviously started then getting girlfriends within the neighboring communities. Now, you must remember that the ANC draws its base predom predominantly from the Khoza people. And you'll find that the majority of black people at the top of the ANC are Khoza. Although you get the smatterings of, of other races and other tribes, by and large it's a, it was always a Khoza movement. And so, when these folks, these men had Zulu, Zulu men had Khoza girlfriends, um, you would find that one of these girlfriends would be necklaced in front of the back. And that would be the girlfriend of one of the men inside there. And one of the, and, and the, the men would be necklaced on the way into the barracks from his work, just one at a time here and there. And those necklaces would never be reported on or never mentioned, but they happened. Why were they never mentioned? Well, that's a question which um, I, I haven't been given the answer of. Um, it just seems to me that um, so many individual necklaces and murders took place that they probably never weren't newsworthy anymore, or I don't know the, the answer to that. Um, you know, um, the press has, has certainly been very favorable towards the ANC. I even remember situations where there, was, there were two massacres within a week of each other. Mm -hmm. Each massacre in which innocent women and children were butchered dreadfully. The massacre that took place where causes were butchered received worldwide attention. The massacre where Zulus were, were mentioned was maybe on the, maybe made the provincial press. Never made it out of the country. So the ANC really has a, uh, a chorus or a choir in the press. 
The ANC has never been a spontaneous movement of the people. The ANC is an enormously well-financed organization which is as communist as an organization can get in its methods of coming to power. This seems to be true even of the American press that was over there. Mm. Uh, did not report the matter objectively. Yeah. I've heard the matter disputed on the radio mm. where they say, well, yes, we do have communists in the ANC because we're a democratic organization. <laughs> as democratic as the USSR was. Yes. Um, we were always keenly aware that the top 12 people in the ANC were, had exactly the same names and identical faces to the top 12 people in the South African Communist Party. <laughs> um, yet, when, you, when I brought this up and mentioned it to people who were pro ANC, they um, just ignored that and, oh uh, well, you know, turn aside and make some glib excuse. But the bottom line is that um, the methods that the ANC used to come to power were the traditional methods which we always learned were those used by communist terrorist organizations. And um, when is an organization a terrorist and when are they freedom fighters? It's one of those questions. Well, this, <coughs> this situation, as I gather, escalated mm. when the, uh, especially exploded when the ANC was re and no longer outlawed. That's right. And when it returned to the country. That's right. Well, the ANC wasn't only uh, was not only unbanned, but in fact the police were um, were crippled in their ability to deal with the problem. Um, the police in South Africa, contrary to people thinking that South Africa is a police state, I think statistics will show that there's approximately, I think, a third the number of policemen per capita in South Africa in relation to America or England. Um, it could even be worse than that, but I know that there's a fraction of the number. I know that the policemen there are extremely poorly paid, extremely poorly equipped, and labor under the most dreadful regulations. For instance, um, in America, if you pull a gun on a policeman, or if you even look like you're pulling a gun on a policeman, he is allowed to shoot you dead, yes. and there's no questions there. Well, yes. there might be an inquiry, but he's justified. Yes. I, um, I knew some... South African policemen who happen to be decent, upright, God-fearing people who actually lived in a hell on earth. And um, please allow me just now to tell you about the Zulu policemen that I knew as well. But these guys told me that the regulations that they had to work under were that you were not allowed to shoot at somebody unless that person was not only shooting at you, but he had a possibility of hitting you. I mean, it's ludicrous, but that's the, those are the ridiculous kind of regulations that they had to, to work under. Well, I remember talking to a, a judge mm -hmm. in Cape Town mm -hmm. who impressed me with his intelligence, mm -hmm. and I understood at the time that the South African judiciary was highly respected. Mm -hmm. Your laws were a combination, as I recall, of Dutch and French and English. Mm -hmm. So it was a, an unusual combation yes. of, uh, of Roman laws. Dutch law. You had flogging, you had hangings, mm -hmm. you had one appeal, mm -hmm. which is only based on new evidence. Mm -hmm. And uh, you had hard labor. You had hard labor. Mm -hmm. And crime was uh, not long sentences, but severe. Yes. So crime was not repetitive particularly. No. And it was not a problem. No. Well, when did that no. begin to fall apart? What did the what, how did the courts behave? Well, you know, um, I'll say this for the courts. Until right um, until this day, until very recently, I feel that the courts have really tried at all times to interpret the law that they operate under quite fairly. Um I think the problem is that, that certain, you see, you, you, you have to look, look at, at, at the law and the war that you're fighting. Now, 
um, if you're going to be playing football, then both sides of the football field have to have to play on a level field first of all, and they have to have equal number of men, and they're both going to be allowed to do things, not do certain things, to make it a worthwhile game. And the same applies to law and order. Um, when you have an organisation that is an, a blatantly that uses blatantly terrorist methods to get its way, you have to protect the people that help you. If you have somebody who passes on information about people who murder and rape and kill and slaughter and do things to other people, you need to give that person a confidence that he's not going to be exposed for giving that information. Correct. Yeah, Otherwise, yeah. it's self-defeating. And so South Africa had these laws, such as one they called the 90-Day Detention Act, which meant that, that, uh, that the police could present evidence to a judge, and the judges were very independent of the, of the government. And if the judge could see that, that, the, that they had sufficient evidence to, um, to make the cause worthwhile, the judge would authorize them locking up certain people for 90 days at a time. And this could continue indefinitely. And I'm not saying that this is a fair law in a society where people play by the Queensbury rules. But South Africa was fighting against people who, were, who thought nothing of murdering innocent people to obtain their end. And they had a choice of either giving in to these people or fighting them. And the method of fighting them was when they knew that a certain person was a ringleader, they knew that a certain person was a troublemaker, in a way that would cost other people's lives and affect their ability to go to work, for instance, they would lock up this person until the investigation was complete and until they had caught everybody they needed to catch and removed the informants from the situation. Then they would bring those people to trial and then they would be given the sentence that whatever applied to that particular law that they'd broken. Most of the time the sentence was, was hanging for murder. And so, um, what do I think of the law? I think that the law has been changed by the recent government, and regulations changed to the, to the degree that um, the government has willingly handed over the country on a platter to a movement which in 1989 was, was a pathetic minority movement with no popular support. And it really did not have popular support. They were the laughing stock. Um, they were known to be a bunch of, of silly communists, they were known to be a bunch of people who weren't really in favor of fairness, who really just wanted to take over the government of the whole country, and who really wanted to strip the freedom of, of individual people from South Africa. And these people coming to power is the reason why I think you're going to find that they're going to experience true, ma true majority opposition. Well, the, <coughs> the Zulus, of course, have been in the forefront Yes. of the resistance mm -hmm. to the ANC. Yes. What about the other tribes, the vendors, for instance, and some of the others? Well, as it happens, the ANC has successfully intimidated many of the homelands, and they have not successfully intimidated the others. It's quite obvious which ones they haven't successfully intimidated, because those are the ones who stand accused of all the atrocities. Um, I have the pleasure of knowing people who were um, personal advisors to Lucas Mangopi of Bafutaswana. And that man was, you could almost say, an officer and a gentleman. He was known and loved by all those with whom he had dealings. He was a gentleman, he was fair, he was strict and stern, and he did wonders for that little patchwork court country that he was given control of. And he was never satisfied with the country that he had. He knew that his people should have had a homogenous country, but he took what he could get, and he made the best of it. And he was a good, upright, God-fearing man of high morals. Um, you've got you've got this guy. Now, you know, I'm no, no fan of this um, fellow. I think his name was Osvald Korza, of the this guy. But um, he opposed the ANC, and. Um, simply because he wasn't going to become their lackey. He, would, he refused to be intimidated, and he fought fire with fire. When they came to intimidate him, I, I believe that, that many of the ANC intimidators who moved into the Siskai came out feet first. They were beaten to death by the village. The village was set upon these people who were about to murder or execute someone in front of them, and instead they braved the people's rifles and bullets, disarmed them, beat them to death, and shipped them home. And so... Um, 
you find today there'll be the before the Swana, there'll be the the um, Zulu people and the people of the Suskai um, who have stood up against the ANC and are suffering for it. The <coughs> business of the disorder in, in, in Durban in yes. particular, did it just escalate from week to week and month to month? Well, it exploded in 1990. In 90? Yes. It was 90 the year the ANC came back? Yes. It exploded when they came back. And what was the year that Mandela was released? Um, it exploded within a week of him being released. So within a week of him yes. being released? Yes. So suddenly, um, they were unbanned. Suddenly, they started um, forming their, their terror cells all over the country again. They started, um, there was a massive influx of arms into the country, which the police seemed to lose the will to do anything about. Coming from where? Does anybody know? If, you know, they, um, well, they're Russian arms. You know, they were oh, always... Russian arms. Oh, yes, yeah, yes. Um, the ANC was always heavily supported by Russia in the days of the USSR. RPG-7s, AK-47 rifles. So these came in even after Gorbachev? Mm, I don't know about that. Um, probably, but the, they already had um, the vast bulk of them before Gorbachev. They had them in other parts of Africa. Yes, they did. They had these training camps in Tanzania and in Zambia in particular, and in Angola as well. And the funny thing is that people who came back from the training camps um, started talking about the atrocities that they suffered in the training camps. These people disappeared without trace. Yes. Just, just like the witnesses in the Willie Mandela murder trial also became so intimidated that they refused to testify. Right. So, you know, the, <clears throat> the promise over here was that when Mandela was released, that would end the problem. But it yeah. opened up the problem. Yes, it did. Um, we know Mandela, uh, um, in a way, he's a person who was put in jail, and the reason he was put in jail was because he was discovered to be the ringleader of a group of people who, who were busy planting bombs um, throughout South Africa. Now, most governments apparently take exception to organizations bombing their infrastructure and trying to take power by violence, but apparently South Africa was wrong to take exception to this. And um, that was the reason that I was told that, that Mandela was put in jail, um, along with a lot of people who were caught at this house called Ravonia. Yeah, I, I read the trial transcript. Right. And it was very clear that they were planning an, planning an armed insurrection. Yes. The, uh, somebody said to me that if Mandela had been arrested for such an effort in any other black African country, mm -hmm. he would have been hanged. Yes. And uh, if it happened in any other black African country, mm -hmm. nothing would have been said about it. No. Yeah, well, that's the thing. You know, all Mandela really had to do was sit in jail to become the world figure that he's become. And I think it's it's quite sad that um, those people who watched his town meetings, I happened to be down in, in Texas at the time that he was first released and um, had a town meeting up on the East Coast. And um, I noticed how rude he was and how he made certain faux pas by saying how friendly he was with the Cubans and how he supported the Iraqis at the time. And... I was amazed at how that was just all glossed over, you know, because now this guy apparently can say no wrong and do no wrong. Joe Slovo traveled with him when he came here. Yes. Nobody mentioned his presence. No. No. Well, that's a part of... You know, modern-day South Africa, unfortunately, is almost like living living out um, Orwell's 1984. There's such a mind warp there. There's such a twisting of, of the truth that... It must have been a very strange feeling to have one reality in front of you and around mm -hmm. you and another in the press. Yes. I recall that when I was in Johannesburg in 82, the streets belonged to the blacks at night. Yes. And I remember thinking that that was a rather sinister turn of events. Well, the funny thing you mentioned that because the you'll probably think of the streets of Hillbrow in particular. Yes. And Hillbrow became black because there's a building in Hillbrow called High Point Hillbrow that used to be the focus of Hillbrow. That building was owned by Anglo-Americans 
who followed a deliberate policy of letting the department to black people um, for whatever reason. Now, why do you suppose Anglo-American did that? Hydro, that was a rather fancy district, wasn't it? Um, I don't was no, it a hotel? No, no, it was it was it was a um I don't was no, it a hotel? Say, no, no, it was it was it was a an area where people of modest income generally lived. I see. Um it's hard to say, you know, um, there's an apparently a hostile attitude between the um Anglo American and ANC these days. But um, I'm not so sure that I that, that that we are that we have the whole picture available to us. Very recently, there was a long documentary on American television about Anglo Americans. Yes. In which it was rather fairly done, mm. which is unusual for our TV, mm. and it traced the gradual growth of the diamond and gold industry under the Oppenheimers and so forth. Mm. And it did say at the very end that although they had persist been persistent critics of apartheid, mm -hmm. they actually benefited as a corporation and as a family more than any other people in South Africa mm -hmm. from that system. Yeah, you know, there's certain contradictions. Um, one is that Anglo-American um, controls the largest banks in South Africa. The second is that Anglo-American controls the English-speaking press in South Africa, which is extremely liberal. Um, it's, it's a tough question. You know, here we're touching on, on issues where I, I have a gut feel, but um, I can only speak on, my, on what I've seen and what I know. And I don't really want to make wild speculations, but there's, you know, um, certainly one can judge people by their fruits. And um, I know certainly that, um, for instance, 12 families control something like 75 percent of the shares of the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, and these are very wealthy families indeed by any standard. Do they belong to any particular group? Um, can you can you expand on that? Well, twelve families are they are they linked by religion or ethnic background or any special uh, associations with each other? Yes, yes, they 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 are. Yeah, um, you know, um, one doesn't want to be um, negative about any group of people, but um, most of you could say that the vast majority of major corporations um, are controlled by people who have an association with each other. Interesting thing is that um, the Oppenheimers actually profess the Christian faith. Yes, I remember that Harry Oppenheimer's father converted. Yes, that's right. <coughs> that's right. But um, the majority of of um, the people who do control the very large corporations there. Um, are not, aren't, aren't, you know, they're known to be Jewish people, but, um, you know, they're certainly people of great business skills and great talent, and they've done what they've done through skills and talent. Well, the Jewish community in South Africa has been very prominent in its criticism of the apartheid system. Yes. But what you're saying is that they've benefited greatly in South Africa, from despite it, from it, it, or from it. Yes. Most definitely, most definitely. There's no two ways about that. And you know, the sad thing is, is that there's this, what I regard as a fallacy that the white person of South Africa has been portrayed as the oppressor, and the black person of South Africa portrayed as the oppressed. But um, the average white person, in my opinion, certainly over the last ten years, has become probably one of the more oppressed people in the world. At the time that I left, um, I knew people that were earning 7,000 rands a month income, and that's more or less, now there's about $2,000 a month, who were receiving a net income of not much more than 2,000 rands a month. And the other was deductions for taxes and all sorts of other deductions. Some of those deductions admittedly were for medical aid and pension and that, but 
to me for a man to give up such a proportion of his money before he even sees it. That's 80%. Yeah. Then, of course, the average white South African who owned a house was paying 17% interest on his house loan, which was not tax deductible. Um, if you had a company car and your car's engine blew up and the company fixed your engine and the engine cost a thousand rands to fix, you would have an additional 250 rands deducted from your paycheck because you had to pay to the government 25% of the cost of any repairs done to your car. It was considered a benefit, taxable at the rate of 25%. Um, personal loans were granted at the rate of 22 and 23%. Um, there was just no way to turn, there was just no way that, that people were able to, many people were able to hang on to their houses. It was just, um, if you want to see oppression, I think that's oppression. I, I think that's something like 75% of the personal taxation paid in South Africa was paid by white people. Um, and if we want to talk about oppression, I, certainly the people, the Zulus among whom I, I lived, um, didn't consider themselves oppressed. They had a lot more land than we had. And the, the traditional Zulu method of getting land, certainly the way around us, was that um, if a person was born in a certain area, the person would go to that Zulu chief. Um, and present them with a cash sum of maybe a hundred rand and um, make a feast for that chief on a particular day of uh, some chickens and some bottles of whiskey. The chief would come along with his advisors, um, partake of the feast, and then point out the land that that person was allowed to have. Now that person was then given that land in perpetuity. They never had to buy the land, they never had to pay rates on it, they said they had to give allegiance to that chief. They owned it. But they effectively owned it because it was theirs to do what they, they pleased. And it belonged to them as long as they lived on the land. And the, the method of showing that they no longer lived on the land was that they, if they removed the roof from their house, then that would be the indication that they had abandoned the land and that it was now free for the chief to give to somebody else. So it was tribal land? Yes. So, you know, we used to laugh. Who was the oppressed? I mean, if we wanted to, to get medical care, we used to have to pay um, a lot of money for medical care. And yet, if our Zulu employees wanted medical care, they, they could pay 50 cents and get a heart transplant. And there were these huge hospitals set up. Yes, the hospitals were very large and very crowded, but they were very cheap. I and remember, affordable. I went to Madamsa. Yes. And... Uh, it was very interesting because they they said every weekend they would bring in 12 or more individuals who were moribund as a result of the witch doctors. Mm -hmm. And the doctors at Madunsa were trying to work through the nurses and through apprentices mm -hmm. to find out what the witch doctors were doing uh, because they couldn't treat a poison mm. without knowing what caused mm. the poison, what kind of poison it was, that mm. sort of thing. Mm. And I think at that time the blacks could get medical care for the year for the payment of about a dollar. Mm. They didn't no. have to pay anything else. No, no. This was the size of the system. The blacks could rent a house um, in order to get them, you see, when the, when they moved the blacks out of the slums, now I went to a, a um, private school um, on the outskirts of Cato Manor. And I don't remember if you refer to the history that Cato Manor riots in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. um, well, we were in South Africa at the time that they had those riots. And um, the intention of the government then, and that, that was land which was owned by people of colour. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was the Indian people actually who became slum lords mm -hmm. and they let pieces of land to these people at a rent that they could afford about I think 5 rand to 15 rand a month mm -hmm. in the 60s and then they extracted their, their rent from um, black people who empl they employed to take the rent and um, mm -hmm. in a very brutal manner. Now when the government built these houses for the black people and they did build millions of houses. I think they were the largest provider of public housing in the Southern Hemisphere hmm. at that stage. And um, a black man could rent a four-roomed brick house with an asbestos roof, mm -hmm. with um, running a, a tap in the backyard and an outhouse toilet mm -hmm. for the sum of 15 rands a month. Hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And that was his to rent for as long as he lived. Mm. Um, this is just one of the aspects that I just found so contradictory that, you know, yes, the, there were things that were done that were wrong, but there was so much that was done that was right. And, it, and the people themselves were happy. They could live in these houses. They could, ex- they could, later on, they were able to buy the houses, expand on the houses. They had stable employment. The workforce was happy. The taxation was low. And, um, you know, look what we have today. Well, between 1990 and 1992, that's a very quick period of time, 1993. I mean, we're talking about only three or four years in which the country has been transformed. Mm. Even despite the fact that the sanctions were placed against the country before that. Well, don't forget, the ANC was given a free hand. Like, for instance, they started and passed a law that said that no political party was allowed to receive funding, international funding. To be a political party, you had to enjoy popular support. Right. And Carter registered as a political party. Right. The ANC has never registered as a political party. No, they said they're a freedom movement. And because they never registered as a political party, they were never, they were never cut off. They, they were the only party, they were the only political movement in South Africa that has always been allowed unrestricted foreign funding. Now, why do you suppose the government allowed that? I don't know. I'll tell you, there's, there's theories I have. But, um, you know, it, the actions, you know, you, when you try and figure out something, something that doesn't make sense, you've got, you just use common sense. You look at the fruit. I mean, if you see a lemon hanging off a tree, you can be darn sure it's not a pawpaw tree. And um, the fruit of this is that the government is that, um, you know, you go back from just before that to 1989, the late, latter 1989, the manner in which the clerk came to power was very strange. It was odd. Botha had a heart attack. Is that right? Yes, and the thing is, Botha, Botha was not a man who was showing signs of stress. He was a man who was actually um, increasing his majority every year in Parliament. He enjoyed tremendous support from both the white people and the urban black people as well. Um, I remember that when, when he came in a, in a helicopter to the local um, black cities, he was mobbed. They, they, had, they demonstrated, and I remember seeing the TV pictures, and this was no strange thing. I mean, they weren't going along and saying, look, if, we don't, if you don't cap, we'll kill you. I mean, that's just, they didn't do that. You can see the man was genuinely popular. And then the heart of his career, the man's a, he's popular, he's well-liked, he's healthy, he's happy in himself. Suddenly he comes down with a heart attack. And the party voted him out. Well, um, when he came down with a heart attack, of course, the press left in, made a furor, a huge furor, which seems to be a traditional South African practice by the press, which, and then the, his own, um, cabinet seemed to have a cabinet revolt, um, which was led, I believe, by the foreign minister, Pig Bosa, and, um, and he had regarded Pig Bosa as be, and FW as being his closest associate, and um, he was just informed by them that they no longer considered him fit to govern. And the thing, the tragedy is that FW was not elected on his own popularity. He rode into that election on the back of P.W. Bosa's popularity and electioneering. <coughs> and when he won that election, he won it on premises that were utterly and radically and completely bore no comparison to what he ended up doing. If he had said in that election that he wasn't even thinking of releasing Mandela and unbanning the ANC and doing everything he did, exactly. there is, yes. yeah. if he had said those things, there is absolutely no way he would have won that election. And yet he not only won it, but he managed to stay at the helm while doing all these things. Yes. Now, in the famous query of Lenin, mm-hmm. used when a, a political event occurred, mm-hmm. which is very similar to the police query, it was mm-hmm. who benefits? Yeah. Uh, de Klerk apparently believes that South Africa is going to benefit if black people, and especially the ANC, 
mm-hmm. run the country. Well, there's a big difference between the black people running the country and the ANC running the country. Big difference between the ANC and the black people. Yes. Because the other black people now, uh, who are they going to be able to vote for? There's only, uh, who's, who's going to be on the ballot? The ANC and, and who the else? And the conservatives. No, the ANC, the surrogates, uh-huh. and, the, and they'll be the National Party. And the National Party. Right? It'll be like it'll be like uh, voting in Communist Russia. You know, you can vote for this delegate or that delegate, provided they both belong to the same side. Right. And, you know, the trouble is that I saw this happening, and this is one of the reasons why I just gave up hope for the country, and I had stayed for so long because I thought that we could be an agent for positive change and um, part of the solution. And... I saw the way that these negotiations were being rigged and the talks were being compromised. And, you know, one of the things that didn't the all classical, traditional communist philosophy, um, they packed the table in their favor. They, um, you didn't just have the ANC negotiating with the government, you had the ANC and you had this, this organization, that organization, that organization, hundreds of surrogate organizations represented at the negotiating table. But when the people on the, uh, who were genuinely anti the ANC tried to increase their representation, for instance, you had in Carter, which came as the equivalent of the ANC. They were a political movement. Mm-hmm. Now, the Zulu king right. came along and said, no, look, I want to represent the Zulu people. I'm right. not in Carter. Right. I'm a Zulu. I'm the, I'm the constitutional head of the Zulu people. I want to have a status this meeting regardless of what Nkata have to say. Right. He was ruled out. He was not allowed to attend. He was told, no, you're represented by Nkata. And so every committee in the negotiation was loaded in favor of the ANC. But the clerk went along with all this. Every single time. He um, gave in on every single issue. Along the way, he even, actually gave even issued an amnesty to terrible criminals. Yes, I know. Um, you know, the, the joke going around at the time was that, you know, you had to, to you, you couldn't commit too bad a crime if you really wanted to stay in jail. You know, because you had to, you had to have at least, at least raped and murdered to qualify for amnesty. And that's the joke of it all. This is why you had this explosion of crime, because every criminal who um, promised to do what the ANC told him to do um, was supported by the ANC as being an ANC supporter who'd done what he'd done as an act of war, not as an act of crime, and um, was granted this amnesty. The, if the, the very worst criminals in South Africa were all set, set free simultaneously. That was an interesting distinction, to say that if you commit a crime for a political motive, that it's not really criminal. Well, that's what they claimed. I feel a rape is a rape and a murder is a murder. Of course. I feel that putting a bomb in a shopping tent and ripping innocent children to shreds um, does not qualify as something that should be tried as a crime regardless of the motive, but um, they differ. And of course, it's the, they're very careful in what they did because then they took certain people who had done things like this crazy man who shot innocent Africans in Pretoria at one stage and they held him out as bait to the right wing and they said, oh, well, if you don't have to hang him, then why should we hang these other people who've, who've put burning rubber towels around people's necks? Because, of course, the people who put burning rubber towels around people's necks just said, oh, no, well, we're doing what Mandela told us to do. Because Winnie, Winnie Mandela said, with our, next, with our ties and our matches, we shall set our people free. And um, that was that. Well, what was it like to live at home in Durban? Did you live in the city, by the way? No, no. South town. I grew up in um, in a suburb of Durban itself. I grew up in the suburb of Glenwood, um, which was called Upper Glenwood. It was slightly up on the hill in Durban. And um, like many other people, um, when I when I made a little bit of money and got married and settled down, we initially bought a house in a a town just on the border of Durban called Westfall, and later on I moved further out to a place called Hillcrest, which was a which was a um, community of about 10,000 people, um, about 20 miles um, west west of Durban, in then on, on the main Johannesburg 
Durban Road. Did any of those people reach that town? Absolutely. Um, you know, to, to look at the change is just astounding. Um, when I grew up, um, the house we lived in in the, in the 60s um, and even early 70s never had any burglar guards on the, on the window. Um, we stepped with our windows open at night. Um, if you heard a noise outside, you'd go outside of the flashlight and if there was a person thinking of stealing something he saw you, he was sufficiently um, in fear of the force of the law and order to run away. Um, when I lived in Westville, it wasn't quite the same, but it wasn't bad. You had burglar guards in your windows, but it was not unsafe to walk around at night. But let me tell you how I lived before I left, and we can give you some idea. I lived, I lived in a house with an acre of ground, um, which is typical in, because the further out from the city you go, the cheaper the land gets, and so the larger the plot people have. My house was fenced by a six foot high concrete fence on two sides, and by a six foot high um, wire fence with barbed wire on top of it on the other two sides. I had a 10 foot high wrought iron gate, which was kept locked 24 hours a day. My house had burglar guards set into the windows throughout the house, and my front door was covered by a second wrought iron gate, which was also kept locked 24 hours a day. We had a um, burglar alarm system, which we had to activate at night. We, at night, we used to lock ourselves into the sleeping section of the house, and activate the infrared sensors and the burglar alarm to the rest of the house. And when we went to sleep at night, we would have to take the, our firearms, uh, pump action shotgun and uh, automatic pistol and revolver out of the gun safe. We would put them into our um, wardrobe for the evening, fully loaded and cocked with the safety cash on. And that's the way we would go to sleep at night. We had five dogs. Our garden was divided into two halves. The front half would have three dogs out there at night, big dogs, um, dogs you know like the Rhodesian Ridgeback and Bull Mastiff and and um, Bull Terriers, and two dogs at the back. Um, we had a burglar alarm. We had a secondary burglar alarm. The first one was connected to a telephone, which would phone up a private security organization because the police were entirely unable to cope with crime. They would take up to an hour and a half to come if they came at all. And the secondary alarm was a radio connection which was connected to a panic button which also went directly to the security organization. Um, this was not something that we just lived in because we were paranoid. It was something that gradually became like this because of the high instance of crime, of um, people attempting to steal things at night. Um, when we went, if we ever went on holiday, um, we would have to have somebody live in our house every single night and be in the house every single day because if we did not, then we would have a good level of confidence that our dogs would be poisoned and the house would be broken into for the sake of sheer crime. Um, when we went shopping, when we went shopping, um, if we went shopping in the early evening hours, it would be to a local 7-Eleven type of store and there would be a big friendly Zulu man standing outside the front of the store with a shotgun in his hand. Um, so that you were relatively safe walking in and out of the store. If you ever went shopping to any of, any of the local shopping centers, um, you would drive into the parking lot while looking to see if anybody was um, standing around. If they were, you'd generally drive off and come back later. And if they weren't, you would stop the car, you'd get out of the car as fast as you could, and get away from the car as fast as you could, because that was the time when it was easier to be hijacked. Um, there were examples of people who um, would pull into their driveway and get out to open their gate, at which point someone would jump out of the bush next to them, murder them, um, take their minivan, and with their kids inside. And um, there's no telling what would happen to the kids. Sometimes the kids were found wandering on freeways in some remote area, and sometimes they were never heard of again. Um, when I left, we no longer used to, um, in the good old days, when there was law and order, we used to drive down the main road uh, up to the mountains or down the coast, and we used to carry a big bag of sweets in the car with us. 
And when we saw a bunch of little Zulus at the side of the road, or African people at the side of the road, we would throw sweets out the window, you know, as we drove past, and they would pick up the sweets, and they would wave, and there'd be a lovely feeling of goodwill. By the time we left, um, they were doing things like um, suspending two litre bottles of coke filled with sand over a bridge. And the car would drive into that and crash a hundred yards down the road where there'd be a crowd of people to pick up the pieces and um, kill the driver if he wasn't already dead and steal, steal the bits and pieces off the car. Um, we were, to all practical purposes, the last year that we were there, we were no longer able to drive down to the holiday cottages down the coast or to the holiday hotels down the coast. It was no longer safe to drive inland to the mountains. Um, to the mountain resort that we used to go and visit and travel, it was just no longer safe. And my sister was telling me that when they do it nowadays, you definitely don't travel at night, but you used to be able to always travel at night. And when you do travel during the day, you go fully armed. Um, our doctor, um, just after we left, we heard that our local um, general practitioner doctor was driving his car on the main Durban Johannesburg Road when suddenly out of the blue, he was surrounded by two or three African taxis to force them off the road. They got out the car and they were in the process of dragging him out the car and beating him when another motorist came along, saw what was happening, took his life into his hands, took out a gun, shot out the windows and shot at these taxis and um, just the presence of one other person with a gun caused these people to get back into their cars, drive off and leave the doctor alone. Now I know this happened because it happened to a man who was our family doctor. So, um, when we went on holiday, we went to a little place called Umslunga Rocks, which is part of Metropolitan Durban on the north coast. And, um, coincidentally, every single weekend we went there, there were shootouts or robberies of some sort. And this was a place where law and order was probably one about the best in the whole of Durban. So that's the degree to which things had shared. We didn't even bother to go to the beachfront. Friends of ours who went to the beachfront um, told us, and in fact my sister told me just, just this week that um, they now have to scrub down the beachfront toilet every single day because if they do not, the toilet and the floors and the walls and the basins become full of feces, um, human waste. Um, people cannot go into the toilet because they get mugged and robbed and raped and murdered inside the toilet. And so if girls go to the toilet, they have to go two or three together. And one way outside while each one goes and two go to the toilet. Um, you do not, my sister said that if you do go to the beachfront and you don't mind the drunk people on the beach and the crime, you take an old towel that you don't mind being pinched, you don't take your watch with you or any wallet or credit cards with you, you just take the cash you need and put in the extra few rands so in case you do get robbed, the robber doesn't get so mad at you for having little money in you that he kills you anyway. She said that the beachfront is now um, covered in police, but there's a disproportionately high force of police there just to maintain law and order, and that the hotels are losing money hand over fist because very few people find it enjoyable to stay in the Durban Beachfront anymore. What do you suppose will happen, Justin, mm. after the election? Also, I believe that the people of South Africa will genuinely lose their freedom. I believe that you will probably find that extreme steps will be taken to prevent white immigration. I am confident, because it's all been done in black and white, that the homeland will lose any semblance of independence that they ever had, and that they are now going to be forced to submit to a harsh, autocratic and extremely vicious rule by a central government. I believe that the economy is going to continue its state of collapse, and I think about the only thing to come out of South Africa will probably be the raw materials mined in the mines, which I believe will continue in business. I was just told the other day by an investment broker who used mm -hmm. to take tours down to South Africa and encourage investments in the country. Mm -hmm. He's advising all his clients to liquidate their South African investments. Yes. I said, well, what's the sentiment in Wall Street generally? He said, the sentiment in Wall Street is favorable towards South Africa. Yes, that's what I'm saying. He said, that, I believe it's the, the Morgan Stanley. Yes. 
is putting up a South Africa fund, a mutual yes. fund, yes. and they're putting it in charge of a man named Diggs. Yes. I said, does Diggs know anything about the the, uh, the country? He said, yes. no, he doesn't know a thing. Mm -hmm. But he said, <clears throat> Wall Street is wall-to-wall -wall carpeted with people who believe in one man, one vote, and that democracy will triumph over all. Well, since you call democracy, um, South Africa, and this is the thing that people said over and over again, you know, that the question over the years has not actually been who rules the black man, because the black man has always been given the opportunity to rule over himself. The question has been who rules the white. Do the whites rule the whites, or are the rights ruled by some other people? Um, in terms of Africa's financial future, I would say that any person who is not um, closely connected with the, with the multinationals should get his money out as fast as he can. If he can. If he can. Um, South Africa has, what you're witnessing in South Africa is the destruction of the middle class. The, the wealthy of South Africa um, have, I believe, behind the scenes, sufficiently bankrolled the ANC and have the ANC sufficiently in their control um, that they are not going to suffer. For instance, um, when I do business with South Africa now, um, I'm quite happy to accept a South African letter of credit from a South African bank. Mm -hmm. I think you find the South African financial, international financial structure will most probably remain intact. Mm. But I would not take anything less than cash with order from anything, anyone other than a major, either a foreign owned or a major South African company. Mm -hmm. Well, you have here the possibility of mutiny against the ANC on the part of other black nations in the yes. country. The majority population of the country. And if they don't succeed in a military sense, which I don't think they would, mm -hmm. they can at least succeed in a, uh, a sabotage sense. Mm -hmm. They're not going to work very well for a government of this sort. Well, there apparently have been something like 30 explosions over the last six weeks in South Africa. Um, planted by the right wing. Um, the majority of the standing permanent force of the South African army is ultra right wing in their view. You know, people who don't know the facts of the matter wonder how can a Zulu find himself in the same boat as a neo Nazi? Well, there's a French element in every society. Unfortunately, the French element of the forces, which is called the ANC, is being allowed to take over South Africa. Mm -hmm. um, I regard the ANC as being no less radical than these crazy people who call themselves the AWB. Mm -hmm. um, and when you listen to these AWB people talking, you take out of it their wild um, philosophy, what you see is and the person of the of their leader, a man whose name is Eugene Terre Blanc, and who's a very charismatic speaker, uh -huh. very, very powerful orator. Um, you just see nothing more than people who do not want to be ruled by anybody. Uh -huh. And what do you see when you talk to typical Zulu? You say, hey, buddy, um, how are you going to like a new cause of president? Uh -huh. And he'll make a rude comment back to you because there is no way that a Zulu intends to be ruled by anyone who does not defeat him in battle. Mm -hmm. And um, you must remember that, that there was a respect between the Zulu and the British and the Zulu and the Afrikaner because you talk to any Zulu mm -hmm. about these things in an open, friendly manner where, where there's not this so-called white man, black man thing, but as, as equals, which mm -hmm. is the way we used to deal with with people, because um, I do speak Zulu and I do speak Afrikaans. Mm -hmm. um, you would find that the typical Zulu man would respect people who can stand up and fight. Mm -hmm. And when you would, in your discussions, it would come out that very often this came out in my discussions with people, and I'm not saying this represents the whole Zulu nation, mm -hmm. I'm talking about my personal experience. Right. 
many people with whom I discussed the matter as a young man, when I was finding my way around and working out how things fitted together, just said straight out, particularly the older Zulus, the, the, what, what you call the cashless, the mm-hmm. older statesmen of the Zulus, they would say, look, you guys came across, you came out of the sea, that's why we were called Umlungus, because of the, you, if you see, look at the word Umlungu, it sounds like a, like, almost like a bubble coming out of water, you know, mm-hmm. and they reckon that we were almost like amphibians that came out of the sea, and the word Umlungu means amphibian. Um, they said, look, you guys came out of the sea, but first of all, the Afrikaners beat us fair and square at, at Blood River, mm-hmm. and I think you know about Blood yeah. River, yeah. And on the Day of the Covenant, and secondly, you English people beat us fair and square right the way up and down the length of Zululand. Mm-hmm. So, fair enough, you beat us in battle, you're allowed to... You can run it. You can, you can run it. Yeah. There's never been a cause that beat a, Zul- beat a Zulus in battle. Uh-huh. So these are usurpers in the true sense of the word. In the true sense of the word, you, what you're getting now is what the world press always portrayed the South African government to be. All right. Now a minority government. There's a big rumor floating around that the communist government or the coming communist government of South Africa will make an entente with Russia to set up a minerals cartel. Now, if they do, a la OPEC, only in mineral terms, then Russia can regain its edge. The Russian government will not need any more loans from the United States or anybody else because they will just increase the price of minerals as much as the Arabs got back on their feet by raising the price of oil. Do you think there's anything to that? Yes. Actually, I don't think it's going to be, it will be between the government of South Africa and if you call Anglo-American the government of South Africa. Because, in fact, uh, I know that one of the jokes around the local business community in South Africa was during the days of P.W. Botha was that um, Gordon Waddell, one of the um, senior men of the ANC, really enjoyed going to the, the Tolstoy, Tolstoy Ballet in Moscow. Uh-huh. And um, Anglo-American has always had um, ties with the Russians well before Gorbachev came on the scene. Yes. Um, they've always had agreements with the Russians concerning gold and particularly concerning diamonds. Yes. And so, um, I see no... The, I believe that the rumor is correct, I would say. I would have no doubt that the rumor would be correct in that the whoever's controlling Russia, whichever big money people are controlling Russia, um, will already have reached an agreement with the people of Anglo-American and Libya. I'd say that that agreement actually... Um, is in effect now. Yes, yeah. yeah. Certainly, there's, certainly there's been communication, personal communication. I mean, um, it wasn't well known during the days of, of, of apartheid that P.W. Bosa had visited every single country in Africa. But he did. Mm-hmm. Um, I had um, friends who um, saw how he did it. He had, there, there was an army transport plane and there was, um, that was fitted out with, with um, a, almost like a module, a container module that was shipped inside this. It was one of these transport planes with the ramps on the back. Mm-hmm. And there was a module which was fitted inside of that, and the inside of the thing was, was fitted out to make, turn it into effectively executive transport. Yeah. And they would fly this module in, um, it was an unmarked plane. Right. Um, he would go into this and he would go off and he'd visit the various contacts that they had in Africa. Anglo-American has always had contacts with Russia long way during the USSR, and so um, yeah, I would have no doubt that 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 is going to be um, exercising of a cartel between the people who own the minerals in South Africa and the people who who control the minerals of Russia. Well, then we're we're going to be inter- faced with some very interesting times. You know that the beers is officially not in the United States because the American mm-hmm. law forbids monopolies mm. and it's official monopoly but that mm-hmm. has not been applied against the diamonds diamond merchants here mm-hmm. at all or the jewelry business mm. and of course if they do raise the price of minerals to us 
mm-hmm. it will have a heavy effect upon our economy. Mm-hmm. We will have to pay whatever we're asked to pay because there are no alternative sources. Mm-hmm. We do expect that in, let's say, another 20 years or so, 15 years maybe at the most, mm-hmm. uh, or at the quickest, we could get similar minerals from South America, but we'd have to find them and exploit them first. But, Arthur, if, if we're prepared to act monetarily to protect our oil interests, why aren't we prepared to act monetarily to protect our mineral interests? Well, we do have the largest air base in the world in Botswana, as you know. Yes. And we have this enormous uh, fortress, which we call an embassy. Is it in Pretoria, by the way? Yes. With a 500-room underground hotel yes. and all that? Yes. Well, obviously, we're prepared for intervention. Yes. But armies do not run economies very well. No. Uh, you can intervene militarily, but you cannot run an economy. Mm. Mm. I think we're going to have some very odd times coming up. Yeah. And of course, as you talk about the escalation of crime and the increase in the number of areas that aren't safe at mm-hmm. night and then at, not in the daytime and then not mm-hmm. anytime, mm-hmm. I can't help but think about the condition of the United States. Mm-hmm. The streets of our cities at night after nightfall are absolutely deserted. Mm-hmm. It's not safe to walk around in metropolitan cities of the United States today. Mm-hmm. And, in fact, many public arenas are unsafe. Mm -hmm. Uh, I wouldn't want to ride the subways of New York City, for instance. Mm -hmm. Uh, Los Angeles is almost a shooting ground. Mm -hmm. So we uh, are repeating some of the dangers that you have escaped. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you see them. Yes. Um, You know, the interesting thing here, you know, people talk about gun control. Well... Let me tell you something. When law and order broke down in South Africa, one of the few things that maintained law and order was the knowledge that virtually every single person was armed. And so, just before I left, when there was the occasional armed bank robbery, and I mean, we had a, we lived in a, in a village that only had about four or five banks, and every single one had an armed robbery. Yes. And this was a period of two or three months, probably, you know. Right. It was just ridiculous. Right. But it was getting to the point where when armed robbery took place, it was like the Wild West. I mean, every, every person around there would draw their guns and start shooting. Well, that's interesting. And um, in fact, it was the fact that the people who wanted to, who wanted to perpetrate the crime were, were better armed than the ones who, who were against crime. And so you had the normal man in the street who would normally have a revolver or an automatic pistol, and the security guards who had shotguns, and the criminals who had AK-47 assault rifles. But even so, the people who had the assault rifles were aware that the, pe- that the people against whom they were matched would often now have pistols and revolvers and shotguns. That in itself was a deterrent well, against their crimes. If you know the other guy's going to shoot back, exactly, then you're not quite so brave. Exactly. Well, Justin, it's been a fascinating conversation, grisly, really, mm-hmm. terrible, terrible period that you've been living through and that your friends are, going, are continuing to live through. Mm-hmm. I want to thank you very much for making the tape. Well, my pleasure, Arthur. You know, really, um, I must tell you that um, my heart goes out. You know, we, we were talking earlier and I said, try the beloved country. My heart goes out for the average black man of South Africa. Because, you know, let's face it, at the end of the day, the Afrikaner is going to suffer like he's never suffered before. The average black man is going to suffer like he's never suffered before. For what? Yes. I agree.